الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this new episode of Women Around the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Usually, people talk about the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam from different aspects. You have his seerah that talks about when he was born, how he was raised up, and about his da'wah, about his life, about his struggles and suffering, about his battles, and how he died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes you look into the aspects and lessons that you can learn from different occasions, his relationships with his companions, Sometimes you look at the Prophet والسلام's attributes or what we call a shama'il, his moral conduct, his ethics, the way he treated others. Rarely we would find in all of this a lot about women, which usually raises the flag, especially to the enemies of Islam who accuse Islam of subjugating women, of oppressing women. And they don't even take the effort to go and ask approximately one billion Muslim women living on the globe at the moment, whether they feel subjugated or not. They fail to look around them to see their own flesh and blood, who were non-Muslims like them, reverting to Islam, accepting the religion, embracing the hijab and sometimes even the niqab, staying home, happy to raise a family after having the highest levels of academic achievements. CEOs resigning their jobs, content with being a housewife, obeying her husband, they fail to see this or they turn a blind eye to it all so that not to see the beauty and benefits of Islam. So they only focus on the empty half of the glass rather than the empty, the the full half of the glass. Now, It's a logical question. Why isn't there so many mentions of women in Islam? While we find that the focus is on men. Well, the answer is quite easy. Women are not a sidekick. They play a very important role in Islam, but their role is behind the curtains. Their role is concealed and covered. That's why we don't have women orators or women leaders or women coming up front and addressing the masses because this old defies the purpose of the hijab. Now, in order to understand the culture, you have to look and study how women were treated 15 centuries ago, not only in Arabia, but also in Persia, in the Byzantine Empire or the Roman Empire, which were the two superpowers at the time. So look at how women were treated and then compare that with what Islam brought. In Arabia, a person who was told that his wife gave birth to a baby girl 
he would have wished that a truck hit him instead of having a girl. Because having girls in the family, having women in the family was a disgrace, was something shameful. Allah described this in the Quran where Allah says, and when one of them is informed of the birth of a female, his face becomes dark and he suppresses grief. He hides himself from the people because of the ill of which he was been informed. Should he keep it in humiliation or bury it in the ground? Unquestionably, evil is what they decide. Imagine that the Arabs, whenever they were blessed with a baby girl, once she was six or seven years of age, they would take her and bury her alive so that they won't be ashamed of what she chooses in the future or the shame that she would bring to her family, so they think. Women used to be inherited like furniture and like wealth and like property. So if a man dies, his wife is inherited by his sons. They allow her to marry or not. They allow her to go out or not. She has no right, none whatsoever. Women did not inherit. Only the men inherited those who died. Women had no choice, had no voice, had no weight in the community and the society. Islam came to change all of that. And the change was so radical, yet so effective, that within less than 23 years, and this is the span of the Prophet's message, alayhi salatu he stayed among his people for only 23 years. And with the grace of Allah, managed to overturn such false beliefs 180 degrees. The women had a right to inherit, had a right to refuse being married to someone they don't want, had the right to seek separation from a husband they dislike through khulr. Women had the right to keep their name, unlike what's happening in non-Muslim countries when a woman gets married, she's stripped of her own family name and obliged and forced to take her husband's name. Islam prohibits this and says that a woman has the right to sell and buy, to own and possess, and to keep her name. So if you imagine that the Prophet ﷺ was born into such an environment, was born in a city called Mecca, which is, was a mountainous desert area. Men were so rough and tough, almost without emotions. And if they had some, it was next to impossible to express it. They treated women as garbage. They looted one another. Tribes used to attack other tribes. And it was survival for the fittest. In such an environment, you would have expected the Prophet ﷺ to come and be part of the clan. At least share with them what they all had. But this only to prove to you that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was the perfect human being. And that he was sent from Allah جل, as the messenger of Allah to represent this beautiful religion of Islam. This religion that transformed people 
from barbarians to civilized. And if you look at this transformation, you could not stop yourself from raising your hat and saluting the process that took place in a number of years. The Prophet ﷺ came with a religion that gave women life, that took women out of the darkness, restored their dignity, their humanity, and all of this through the Quran and the Sunnah. Women by nature are weak. Physically, this is how Allah built them. Weak. They are weaker than men. Generally speaking. And this is not their fault. They are also weak sentimentally. So they are overwhelmed with emotions which may ham hamper and hinder their decision process. Yet this is not a weakness. It is a point of strength. A woman who is full of emotions, a woman who is full of feelings, is a rose in a desert. Just looking at it fills your heart with joy. And the more of this weakness in her, the more beautiful and cherished by everyone else, without any exaggeration, exaggeration, of course. Now, Islam came to cater and care for this natural weakness in a woman. This is why Every time the Prophet ﷺ used to address the masses of the Muslims, he used to advise them and remind them to take care of women. Take care of women. Because he knows how the whole community was brought up and how they felt towards women, and this was his job to change their perception and to fix it because it was broken. So the Prophet used to always advise them and say, take care of women because they were created from a rib, meaning that Eve was created from Adam's rib. And the Prophet said, and the rib, the highest point of it, is twisted, is crooked a little bit. So it, the rib is like this. If you want to straighten it up, you will break it. And if you leave it as it is, you'll enjoy it, but with a bit of a twist. So take good care of women. This is the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. If you look at how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with women, you cannot believe that this man was born and raised in such a harsh environment that used to deal and treat women as trash. Subhanallah, how he was able to transform the way men treated women and how he made that an essential part of his religion. Nowhere you can find, or anyone on earth, nowhere anyone can find one single thing that tarnishes the reputation of the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to dealing with women. Whether it was one of his daughters one of his wives, or even the non-Muslim women. All of his actions and rhetoric 
went into the same channel of taking care of women and being kind to them. And Islam came to promote this, to take care of women, whether she is a wife, a daughter, a child, a widow, no matter what kind of a woman, Islam came for us to take care of them. Look at this incident. And there's so many incidents that it would take us the full whole month of Ramadan to talk about. Once Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, visited the Prophet والسلام, And Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, was shouting at her husband, the Prophet والسلام, When Abu Bakr was admitted and permitted to enter, he went to slap his daughter for raising her voice over the Prophet ﷺ. And immediately, the one who came in between was the Prophet ﷺ. He prevented his companion from hitting his daughter, who happened to be the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. And he kept on defending her until Abu Bakr left the house and he was in rage. And the Prophet ﷺ started to boast about it to his wife, saying, didn't you see how I defended it, you? Didn't you see how I defend you? Wasn't I good to you in protecting you from the man who is your father? A few days later, Abu Bakr came to visit again. And this time, he found Aisha and the Prophet ﷺ laughing and talking happily. So he said, as you had admitted me in your war, today admit me in your peace and let me join you in your peace as what I see. And they said, we have done so. Come, come and join us. So the Prophet والسلام's mercy to his wife exceeded the mercy of her own father who wanted to reprimand her. Any other man would have been happy to see his father-in-law beat his wife just to get even. Not only that, Anas ibn Malik tells us about a story that is mind-blowing. The Prophet ﷺ, and you can imagine the scenario, is sitting in Aisha's house. And there are companions in that house. When a servant comes with food in a plate from Safiya bin Tuhayya ibn Akhtab, the co-house, the co-wife of Aisha. She's sending food to the Prophet in Aisha's turn or Aisha's day. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was outraged. She went and she struck the servant's hand, making the plate fall and break. And the food sh spread all over. Now, what would you do? If your wife does such a thing in front of your friends, the Prophet ﷺ, who is on top of the pyramid, he's the highest man of his time, stood up, gathered the food, collected it, and comforted his companions who were in shock. And he said, don't worry, don't worry. Your mother has become jealous. What she did was due to her jealousy. Look at the words chosen, your mother. He didn't say this woman. He didn't say my wife. He praised her by saying she is the mother of the believers. Your mother has become jealous. The Prophet والسلام, honored mothers when he said, the best of your companionship is, the, 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 the most worthy of your companionship is your mother. The companion said, then who? Your mother. Then who? Your mother. Then who? Then he said, your father. And when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ asking permission for jihad, the Prophet said, is your mother alive? And the man said, yes. 
So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, go to her and stick to her feet, for paradise is there. Even Islam honored a wife. So the Prophet tells us, be kind to your wives. The best of you are the best to their wives, and I'm the best to my wives. He said that the women are identical and equal to men. They are the sisters of men. Islam honored the daughter and told us that whoever is blessed and tested by any of these girls as daughters, they will be his visor and screen from hellfire, providing you take care of your girls. Taking care of widows. Subhanallah. The Prophet said, the man who cares and is in charge of a widow and a poor person, he's like a person doing jihad in the cause of Allah or like someone who's praying nighttime all night and fasting all day. Islam had honored a woman. Islam is so merciful that it dropped prayer and fasting when a woman is in her menses or postnatal bleeding, dropped financial maintenance. Even if she's rich, she doesn't provide for her husband. She's not obliged to provide for her siblings while they are obliged to provide for her. Islam dropped Friday prayers and congregational prayers so that women could be in their homes and at the comfort of their homes. Islam obliged men to give women dowry and prohibited men to take a penny from their women. It's the financial responsibility of men. Islam gave a share of her husband's inheritance her father's wealth, even she's not obliged to provide for anyone, she still receives money. Islam dropped jihad. Women don't have to go to jihad. They don't even have to go to hajj if they don't have a male mahram to accompany them and to take care of them and to protect them. Islam protected women. So a woman cannot get married unless her guardian approves of it in the presence of two male Muslim witnesses so that her chastity would be protected and no one can say, no, she did not get married and she gave birth out of wedlock. No, we have a system to protect her chastity to the extent that Islam protected a woman from an irresponsible word. Anyone who slanders a woman He's obliged to bring four male witnesses to testify that she fornicated. If he failed to do so, he would be flogged 80 lashes just as a consequence of an irresponsible word he said about a Muslim woman. After all of that, they claimed that Islam subjugated women. So in this series, inshallah, starting from tomorrow, we will try our level best to give a glimpse and to highlight a number of women whom the Prophet ﷺ knew and who had an impact on his life. هذا والله أعلم ونسبة العلم إليه أسلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. As you may have realized by now that the format of this program is that the first half is devoted for the women uh, around the Prophet and the second half is devoted to answering some of your questions whether through phone calls or through emails and you'll find that the numbers are displayed at the bottom of the screen if you have uh, a wish to give us a call. So Suhail says, 
What is your opinion about i'tikaf during the COVID-19 coronavirus? Can we do this at home? And what about women? Can women observe i'tikaf at home during normal times? The answer is no. I'tikaf is a ritual that can only be done in masjids. So COVID-19 is not a reason to change the religion, meaning if someone says, oh, Sheikh, you can see now due to the COVID-19, we are unable to make Umrah. I said, yes, a good observation. So can we make Umrah in our homes? <laughs> the answer is definitely not. So likewise, what was prescribed to be performed in the masjid has to be done as such until Allah Azza wa Jal uplifts this crisis and catastrophe that we are all suffering from. I'tikaf can only be performed in masjids. Some scholars even limited that to the three major masjids in Islam, which is the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, al Masjid al nabawi in Medina, and al Masjid al-Aqsa in Al-Quds in Jerusalem. But the most authentic opinion is that it is open to all masjids that are full-fledged masjids which means that a prayer hall in a mall does not qualify for i'tikaf. A prayer hall in your company or in your residential building, these are all do not qualify as masjids because any second the owner can change the location or turn it into a shop or a warehouse. But a full-fledged masjid, this is waqf. This is for Allah Azza wa Jal. No one can sell it. No one can inherit it. No one can give it as a gift. So I hope this answers your question. Aisha says, how should we spend the last 10 nights of Ramadan? Well, the Prophet والسلام, had a major thing to do during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And that is to pray all night long. So whenever the 10 nights were due, the Prophet ﷺ would tighten his apron or waist wrapper. And some say that this is a metaphor for not having intimacy with the wives. And some say that this is a metaphor for doing a lot of effort and striving and doing what you want to do to the most utmost uh, uh, level. So he used to do that. He used to wake up his women, his wives, and he used to revive his night, meaning that he would make the night alive with prayers, reciting the Quran, and long, long uh, rak'ahs. So this is the vast majority of what a person has to do in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Most of us won't be able to do even half of that. So you do whatever you can to the best of your ability. Engage in making dua. Because Mother Aisha came to the Prophet والسلام, and said, Oh Prophet of Allah, teach me something to say if I were to notice Laylatul Qadr. So the Prophet said, to her say, Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anni. Oh Allah, you are forgiven and you love to pardon, so pardon me. So if you do this a bit, this a bit, recite the Quran a little bit, do dhikr a little bit, so that the whole night is engaged in good deeds, that would be an excellent thing for you to do. Uh, a person who did not give his name said, how should we give ghusl to the people who die due to the COVID-19 and how to perform funeral prayers? I heard hospital wraps the dead body with plastic and send directly to graveyard in this situation, what is to be done according to Islam? First of all, this is only done by ignorance. 
Even medical doctors say that this is nonsense. The World Health, Health Organization said that COVID-19 is not uh, 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 transferred through washing. It is transferred through touching a surface that is affected by it and by breathing. A dead person does not breathe. So if we have a dead corpse and you have your masks and gloves, you can wash that individual without any problem, shroud him. After he's shrouded, you're totally protected. Normal people can carry him without a fear of uh, uh, contracting that uh, a deadly virus. And he can be preyed upon, buried in the normal Islamic way without any problem. It is not contagious to wash a dead body of a person who died due to uh, COVID-19. A brother says, people in our country are praying in the masjid during this lockdown as some prominent muftis are saying that this lockdown does not apply to mosques. All daily prayers, including Jumu'ah prayer, will happen as normal with the precautionary measures that there would be a proper distance between rows and individuals, that is six feet, during congregations. Is it allowed to pray with such gaps between the followers or is it an innovation? First of all, if you are in a Muslim country that is ruled by a Muslim leader, then you have to obey what the leader says and not to listen to any Tom, Dick or Harry or any Mufti or any uh, this or that because this is a crisis that requires a decisive directive from the highest level. So one Mufti says, you have to do this. Other Mufti says, you don't have to do this and putting the Muslims in confusion. This is the role of the Muslim ruler or leader. He's the one who has to intervene and gives his directive. So first of all, don't listen to these muftis. If you are in a Muslim country, you have to abide by what the Muslim ruler is telling you to do. And praying in home, you will be rewarded as if you're praying in the masjid. Because Allah told you to obey your leader. And at the same time, this is a collateral uh, uh, issue. It, it's something that you can't take a decision which may have negative consequences over the whole country. And then said, whoops, I did it again. I wasn't aware that it will be this serious. Well, this is your problem. Don't be a Rambo, as I said so many times. Be with the jama'ah of the Muslims in whatever they decide, even if you think that this is not the right decision. If you are in a non-Muslim country, and by law, this is a crime to go and pray in the masjids, you have to pray home. Don't let the non-Muslims take this as means of attacking Islam and the Muslims and accusing the Muslims of spreading the virus and doing this and doing that. Now, if the Muslim leader says you can pray in the masjid and then they tell you to keep a six feet distance between you and the man praying next to you, though this is a big innovation and it would not protect you from the virus if Allah wills the virus to come and get you. What will you do with prostrating on the carpet or on the floor where others have prostrated maybe a few hours ago? So this is not logical. This kind of innovation of leaving a six feet gap is unacceptable. And you're best, better and it's best for you to pray home rather, to, uh, rather than to join such an innovation. Allah Azza wa knows best. Anhar says, 
I wanted to know if I'm on my period during Laylatul Qadr, how can I take advantage of it as I cannot fast and I cannot pray? It's true that you cannot pray. Fasting is done only on the daytime. So from Maghrib till Fajr, if you are unable to pray, you're able to do everything else. You can read the Quran. You can make dhikr. You can make dua. You can engage in so many good things other than the prayer. So the sky is the limit. Feeding the people who are in need, helping others, uh, helping your parents in the house, making dhikr, reading the Quran, reading a lot of the Quran would definitely compensate for your inability to pray. Mushtaba says, in India, the adhan for prayer is done at varying times because of the school the mosque follows. Now, if I hear an adhan first and I stop whatever I'm doing and reply to it, and about five or more minutes later, the other mosque gives adhan, do I need to reply to them and stop what I'm doing again? First of all, the concept of stopping when the adhan is being called, I don't know any basis of it. So if I'm eating and the adhan is called, I don't have to drop the spoon and just listen. If I'm writing, if I'm working with a hammer and a nail, if I'm typing, if I'm talking to someone, I don't have to stop. The sunnah is to repeat. I can do that while doing whatever I'm doing. I don't have to, to stop. And even if I don't want to repeat, I don't want to. Again, I'm not sinful. This is a recommended sunnah. I'd be losing reward for not repeating behind the imam, the mu'adhin, but I'm not sinful, definitely, for not repeating. So if I hear the adhan, from a masjid close by, and I repeat after him, and afterwards I say the dua, and I ask for Allah Azza wa Jal to grant our Prophet al wasila. And then five, ten minutes later, I hear another adhan. Am I obliged to, as I said in the beginning, neither the first nor the last, you're not obliged. It's a sunnah. So if you hear the second adhan, if you repeat behind him, and say the dua, it's reward again. If you don't, there's no sin, none whatsoever upon you, and Allah knows best. Zulaikha says, does your wudu break if you touch your private part after making wudu? This is an issue of dispute among scholars. Because there are two hadiths. One of them stated that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said that if a man touches his private part, should he perform wudu? In one hadith, the Prophet said, yes. And in another hadith, the Prophet said, it is a part of your body. It's like any other organ in your body. So scholars differed whether one is more authentic than the other or not. And whether one obligated the other or not. And they have a lot of dispute and discussion regarding these two hadiths. It seems, and Allah knows best, and this is the opinion of Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, to combine both hadiths, that we would assume that touching the private part nullifies your wudu, if you touch it with desire and lust. And if you touch it as you touch your hand or your thigh or any other part of your body without any feeling or desire, then this does not nullify your wudu and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Anas says, my question is regarding 
the importance of weak hadith, that is da'if. Should we follow the da'if a hadith? And what is the Islamic ruling for it? Because I have heard people saying to not completely reject them as they are, after all, considered to be hadiths. This is an issue of dispute among scholars. The reason of the dispute is that some imams considered the hadiths that are weak to be better than using, using your analogy. So this came up when the Hanbali school of thought came to a fork of the road over issues that were not clearly covered by the Quran and the Sunnah. So they looked into the issue and to be able to determine and give a verdict, they had one of two, either to rely on their analogy and their logic or to search in the weak hadiths and find a hadith that is weak, yet it supports a verdict and they followed that. Imam Abu Hanifa used to follow the analogy and the logic due to the fact that he did not have a lot of hadiths at his time to rely on. Due to the fact that he did not travel as did Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmed. He was always in his village, in his town. And people from all over came there and shared with him some of the hadiths that they had heard, but not all of it. While Imam Malik traveled, Imam Shafi'i traveled, and Imam Ahmed traveled the most. So he got to meet people who heard the hadith from different companions who were traveling all over after the death of the Prophet ﷺ and managed to learn from them more. Now, the problem is that when we come to a weak or da'if hadith, scholars that said that we can refer to it sometimes said that there are conditions. One, that the weakness of the hadith is not due to one of the narrators being a liar or being an innovator. Rather, being weak in his memory, his books were burnt, so now... He doesn't have any references. He's giving hadith from his memory. This is why it's weak. Secondly, it should not be in halal and haram. So it should not be related to fiqh or to aqidah. Rather, it is related to fada'ilul a'mal, the deeds that are not of essence. So whoever prays two rak'ah between this prayer and that prayer, Allah would grant him a house in Jannah. Is there in halal haram? No. Is there anything to do with aqidah? No. It is something recommended to pray? Yes. So this da'if hadith, we can adopt it. And so on. And this is why the scholars have differed. Some of them said, it is okay to use weak hadiths when it's related to things that do not deal with aqidah or with halal and haram or with verdicts of the deen. Others said no. When Allah said that he will protect the religion, that he is the one who revealed the dhikr, which includes Quran and Sunnah, and that he is the one who's going to protect it, the weak hadith is not part of the protected one. And when Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم, today I have completed your religion, the weak hadith is not part of the religion that was completed. Therefore, and this is the opinion of Sheikh al-Albani, we only rely on the Quran, the authentic hadiths, with the understanding of the three favorite generations, the generation of the companions, tabi'in and tabi'at tabi'in. And I'm inclined to this opinion because it's the safest and it is as crystal clear you cannot bring weak hadiths and make the firm foundations which Islam is standing on a little bit shaky because of such weak hadiths. Allah knows best. 
Arusa says, are we sinful if we clean the spider web from the house or washroom? Because I heard about a hadith where the spider protected the Prophet ﷺ through their web, so we should not clean it. Is this true? No. The, an the answer is, this is not true. The incident where the, when the Prophet ﷺ was in the cave when he was trying to migrate from Mecca to Medina, and, and <clears throat> the idol worshippers were trying to look for his hiding place. And while he was hiding with Abu Bakr, Allah sent a spider and it made a web on the entrance of the cave. And Allah sent a dove or a pigeon and the pigeon laid a couple of eggs over a nest of hers there. So the idol worshippers saw it and said, no, definitely no one could have entered here. And they left. This story is not authentic, and therefore, there's nothing wrong in cleaning your house and removing the spider web. A sister says, my sister-in-law and her husband do not attend any nikah da'wah. Uh, that is the feast given by the bride's side. As they say, eating at nikah is haram. They are extremely rich, and the alliance they're looking for, their daughter, are also from rich people. But they are saying they will not give nikah da'wah, and that the nikah should take place in the masjid and won't feed groom family, but walima should be grand. Is it correct? Unfortunately, so many people combine between ignorance and arrogance. And this is so funny, yet it is sad at the same time. You see a lot, especially from my position, and I read questions and I face people on Twitter and I see how arrogant and ignorant at the same time where they come and complain and say, why is this? Why? This is the first time I hear something like that. <laughs> SubhanAllah, is it my mistake that you're ignorant, imbecile? And when I say something on Twitter and someone uses vulgar language, he curses and curses me. And then he says, I've never heard something like that. So I bring him the verse of the Quran, which any child would have known in Arabia. But he's not an Arab, of course. No, no offense. No offense, but if you don't know, ask. Don't start shooting. Ask. Say, I've never heard this before, so can you please explain to me? And I'll be happy to do this. But he, they start shouting and, and cursing and, and, and using profanity only to discover at the end that they're this small due to their ignorance. So these couple. They're rich, mashallah, and they're looking for an alliance to their daughter. Whenever anyone invites them to a meal because their daughter is getting married and they're inviting others to attend, they say, no, if the father of the girl is throwing a party, we're not coming. Why? He says, because this is haram. Oh, mashallah, you made that haram. He said, yes, it is the responsibility of the man, of the groom. Ya akhi taib, if the father of the girl wants to invite his friends and loved ones, you would say no? It's none of your business. So now they've combined ignorance with arrogance. Now they want someone to come and propose to their daughters. And they don't want to throw any kind of hospitality to the groom's family. Okay, we understand that. But now they want a grand feast where the groom has to pay the money in a five-star hotel for 2,000 people. Subhanallah. Isn't that haram? Isn't that extravagance? It's none of my business. I don't throw a party. Well, this is ignorance from your side, my friend. Whenever people come to ask for the hand of my daughter, I always throw a party 
that is decent for 20, 30, sometimes 100 people just to express my happiness and to gather my friends. The wedding afterwards is according to the groom. He wants to throw a wedding, how big, how small, it's none of my business. Though I would highly advise it to be small and not to spend money and to save the money for their life and for their marriage. But to insist on having a grand walima, this is totally ignorant combined with arrogance, may Allah Azza wa Jal uh, uh, guide them. So the last question is from Umar. And he says, is it permissible to make dhikr like Allahu? The answer is no. It is not permissible to make dhikr by simply repeating the names of Allah Azza wa Jal without anything else. So this is the way of the Sufis. They say Allahu, 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 Allahu. And they keep on repeating it. And after a while, they start moving with the beat and maybe swirling right and left. And after a while, it becomes difficult to say Allahu. So they just say who, 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 who. And they repeat it a thousand times. And you don't know, is this a tribe in, in, in the jungles of Africa or in, 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 in uh, Alaska? What, what is who, who, who? What are you guys doing? He said, no, we're making dhikr. Who's who? He says, no, this is Allahu. This is a pronoun saying him, him. So what are you doing? Some people say, you say Al-Latif, Al-Latif, Al-Latif 120 times. Some say, say As-Sami' if you have a, a pain in your ear and repeat it a thousand times. All of this is nonsense. All of this is an innovation. If it had any roots in Sharia, in Quran, in Sunnah, I would have been more than happy to share it with you. But this is an innovation where shaitan is making fun of you and messing up with your minds. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow, same time. I leave you, Fi Amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.